This is an EM Pulse mini series, Push Dose Pearls, with your hosts, Sarah Medeiros and Julia Magagna. Welcome back to EM Pulse. This is an episode of Push Dose Pearls, our ongoing mini series of brief podcasts that addresses the questions that we all have regarding medications in the ED. And we're here again with Chris Adams, our ED clinical pharmacist at UC Davis and our EM Pulse pharmacist. And today we're going to talk about rapid sequence intubation in the ED. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me back. All right, Chris, let's just dive into it. Let's say that I have a patient with significant head trauma that I'm intubating. Is there a role for pre-medicating with lidocaine or any other medication that I can use to optimize that intubation? Premedication is is one of those areas that was being practiced quite frequently, probably five to ten years ago, and has really started to fall out of favor. The use of different medications prior to intubation really was useful for the idea of potentially avoiding any adverse events associated with that intubation or the medications that we're giving. And it seems like we're starting to gravitate away from those. And we're normally talking about like atropine, fentanyl. Um, Sometimes we would consider using lidocaine. And realistically, that's just not possible or is challenging to do in in an emergent scenario. Why is that, Chris? Like, why is this not a thing anymore? So realistically, these medications should be given roughly two minutes prior to an intubation. And in an emergent scenario, we really run out of time to actually make that happen effectively, especially with medications like fentanyl, where the logistics associated with a controlled substance are challenging, where they need to be removed from a secure location in order to be dosed appropriately. So we just really don't have the time to do it. Plus, there's not great evidence that supports any of these medications and them actually providing any benefit of avoiding these adverse events. Right. I think that's my thing, too, is that you're supposed to do it far enough ahead of time, and I just don't see the evidence on it. Is there any situation where you would, or is there any difference in kids? I personally feel like if you have the time, if you are um, warming up to an intubation slowly where um, it's less emergent and you can potentially provide a medication to a patient with a reasonable amount of time leading up to the intubation, I think the other area that might be useful would be a situation where you are considering intubating a extremely young or challenging uh, pediatric patient where um, they may become or are at high risk of developing bradycardia or are already bradycardic prior to intubation. I think there may be a room for utilization of atropine in a very specific patient population, especially in your neonates or very young uh, pediatric patients. Uh, where they may already be bradycardic or at, are at significant risk of becoming bradycardic, or where you're utilizing succinylcholine and actually could cause bradycardia in a patient. Utilizing atropine might be useful, but we really don't know uh, whether or not this is a, a um, useful intervention. There is no evidence that really clearly defines that atropine is a useful option here. Okay, so let's get to our RSI meds. What is your favorite sedative and why? I generally tend to gravitate towards the use of ketamine in a lot of situations. Uh, Ketamine, it just has an all-around excellent um, profile in terms of adverse effects, as well as providing both sedation as well as analgesia during these, these intubations. Are there any times where you wouldn't use ketamine, like an elderly patient? A lot of the area where ketamine may be potentially um, a little scary to utilize is in patients that are at risk of uh, quickly decompensating. So your severely septic patient that is already extremely ill. There are some cases associated with the use of ketamine in patients becoming severely hypotensive after intubation. So in those situations where you have a patient who's been compensating and is very, very severely ill, uh, possibly those septic patients, we may need to steer clear of ketamine. What about in patients with head trauma, Chris? That's an area that is still very controversial. In my view, we probably, if we can avoid the use of ketamine, if there is no alternative, we could potentially use it. But there is still this possibility that ketamine may increase in intracranial pressure. And in those scenarios, we obviously want to try and avoid that. So generally speaking, there is some evidence out there that um, 
tends to dis- disprove the, that uh, ketamine actually increases ICP after administration. However, there is not enough evidence out there that clearly defines that ketamine is safe in this patient population. So it's still an option and still is used in a TBI patient population. However, it, if we can avoid it, I think it's probably best that we do still. I love ketamine for sedation, for intubation, for sure. Uh, I like it for difficult airways, and I like it for the vast majority of my kids. Now, the neonates, Chris, like the kids that are around birth, let's just say less than six months of age, what about ketamine in that population? I think it's an excellent choice. You are, you're dealing with a, a scenario, again, um, that may be a challenging intubation or maybe a prolonged duration uh, where you're attempting to intubate a patient. And Again, providing a, a longer acting agent such as ketamine really provides a significant benefit to you as well as the rest of your team trying to avoid scrambling to provide a longer duration of sedation. So an excellent option in these neonate patients that may be challenging. So is Atomidate dead? Not at all. <laughs> Atomidate is an excellent choice and still is considered to be the gold standard of therapy. It's just a a short-acting agent, and there are some questions around the uh, adverse effects long-term for these patients. So still a very, very commonly used medication, probably most commonly used medication for intubation. Okay, what about paralysis? What is your favorite paralytic and why? Succinylcholine all day. (laughs) So this is uh, probably a byproduct of the way that I was trained. However, Mm -hmm. the practice that we've been uh, involved with for the last, for for me, for the last five to 10 years is is a very rock-heavy environment. So I think that each has their place in therapy. It's very clear from the review of a number of different publications that we as medical professionals don't do a great job of getting appropriate sedation on board after the use of these longer acting paralytics such as rocuronium. And the reason being is because you can start a paralytic, or excuse me, start a sedation um, medication all day long, but you have no idea whether it's actually effective. So you could be really, really aggressive with your propofol dosing, and that's great, but perhaps that patient needs far more. And so there really isn't an, an excellent way to provide monitoring of how effective these sedation agents are after you give these longer acting paralytics. So rocuronium just has its challenges, albeit in most situations, it's quite safe, right? There's no adverse effects associated with the use of rocuronium. However, the majority of patients are going to tolerate the use of succinylcholine very well. And so I, I personally feel like a lot of patients would benefit from the use of succinylcholine over rocuronium. Is anyone using vecuronium? Very few. Uh, vecuronium, especially in an emergency department setting, is, is uncommon. And that's for a number of reasons, specifically because it takes quite a while for us to actually prepare it. So it's, it's a, a powder form and it needs to be reconstituted before utilization. So you're talking like a three to five minute delay before we're even ready to intubate a patient. Really, the only place that's using uh, vecuronium these days is patients in the PICU, uh, as well as some flight teams. Yeah, that's where I've seen it used and definitely not using that one (laughs) myself. (laughs) So what about reversing ROC? Right. And that's a very important question. So uh, you're talking specifically about the use of Sagamidex. Um, so this medication really came into its uh, into its fame in the uh, operating room setting, where you're trying to actually get patients um, out the door and and increase throughput through an OR uh, as quickly as possible. And so a in a post operative setting, if you have a little bit of paralytic sticking around, the use of Sagamidex to get rid of that is an excellent option because then you can get a patient extubated and move on to the next case. In, in an emergency department setting, that's really not where Sigamidex was initially investigated and where it was. it's not really meant to be utilized as a, a potential option to reverse paralytics. So in a situation where you really need that paralytic to be gone, when, when rocuronium uh, it needs to be uh, completely out of the picture in order to conduct a neurological exam, in those situations, it may, may be prudent to utilize something like Sigamidex. The problem is, is that Sagamidex, one, is an expensive medication when we really don't need to use it in some situations, especially if you have other shorter acting paralytics. The other problem is that it kind of messes up your, the care of the patient ongoing. 
So if a patient needs to go to an operating room setting to get re-paralyzed after they get Sigambidex, that, that becomes a very challenging scenario for our anesthesiologists because they're not able to utilize their standard paralytic agents. So in those cases, we are having to turn to um, more tricky uh, paralytic medications where it really is, is not useful or, or more challenging for the anesthesiologist to provide care in the OR. That's an interesting thought. I hadn't really thought about that uh, when talking about reversal. So that's interesting. Chris, after we have intubated, what is your go-to sedation medication? So I think that the majority of uh, individuals practicing within emergency medicine are so used to pulling the trigger on propofol. It's just easy. And that's um, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, not an option. So you, we find ourselves in situations where hypotension is a serious issue. And so the use of agents like propofol are challenging or in a pediatric patient population, realistically, starting it for a short period of time is not a big deal. However, long term, propofol is probably not going to be a useful agent for those, those kids that are going up to the PICU. So realistically, propofol, it has an, a strong hold on, uh, in terms of a place in therapy for post-rapid sequence intubation in most patient populations. However, we need to start thinking about other options, such as the use of Presidex sometimes. The challenge, though, with Presidex or dexmedetomidine is that you are uh, – it's an inappropriate choice in these long-acting paralytic situations. So if you've given a patient rocuronium, that patient is still paralyzed, and Presidex is not a strong sedative agent. Its true claim to fame here is moderate sedation. So the patient is still arousable, and that's not the type of patient that you want to be paralyzed while it's getting Presidex. So in those situations, I, I tend to ask for, like, push doses of midazolam or ketamine in order to bridge us through until that paralytic is gone. But generally speaking, propofol tends to be our go-to agent in a, a post-RSI situation. Chris, you've mentioned a couple of times now about patients being paralyzed and not having enough sedation on board. Um, and I can get that in theory that that would be a nightmare of a situation for anybody. But are patients waking up and remembering this? Is this like a thing? It is. Um, and and. Especially with an adult patient population, there are several studies out there that have demonstrated that patients are having a significant PTSD type scenario post uh, an ICU stay after they've been intubated and some recall these instances, albeit that there are not a huge number of these cases out there. So it's probably unusual for any of us as medical professionals to hear these type of stories. However, there are definitely cases associated with a PTSD after uh, intubation and not having appropriate sedation on board. So you mentioned propofol and Presidex. Are there other options? I know, for example, our burn team really likes to use fentanyl and Versed. Can you talk about why that might be the case? Absolutely. So there are a number of scenarios where a uh, pushes of individual medications, especially in a post RSI scenario, may be an appropriate option. So you mentioned uh, a, a burn setting where a patient is going to be intubated for a long period of time. In those scenarios, you're going to have these continuous infusions of sedatives ongoing, and they really, in a lot of cases, cause more harm than good. In a burn setting, there is uh, the possibility of propofol, some evidence suggesting that propofol actually may increase third spacing of fluids. And in those situations, utilizing propofol might be inappropriate. So, and not to mention, they're going to be, these type of patients are going to be on propofol for an, ext an extensive period of time. So burn teams tend to um, at least attempt the use of push doses of Versed and fentanyl initially to try and uh, to get us through to a period where we can consider other options. But third spacing in burn patients is obviously already a problem, and increasing that with propofol may, may be a challenge. But in general, these continuous infusions for long durations of intubation obviously at some point do cause problems such as PRIS or propofol infusion syndrome or accumulation of these, of these other sedatives like fentanyl and Versed. And I've heard people say that propofol, which, as you mentioned, tends to be our go-to most of the time, doesn't have any analgesia. Do you give anything along with propofol for pain control? Absolutely. You know, when, I, when we talk about um, post 
uh, RSI, rapid sequence intubation sedation. It really should be analogo sedation, mm-hmm. right? You, we should always be utilizing an agent that provides some kind of pain relief or analgesia as well as a sedative agent. And that's, in a lot of cases, why ketamine is an excellent option. However, with propofol, because it's so common, because it's so short acting, it's oftentimes a really useful agent. But like you mentioned, it provides no analgesia. And so in addition to propofol, especially if we're starting continuous infusions, we really like to utilize fentanyl because, again, it's so short acting. If we get into trouble, we can turn it off and we have reversal agents for it. What about post-intubation sedation in the setting of sepsis, where we already have shifting fluids and blood pressure issues? Absolutely. So the idea of the use of propofol has not been, we, we haven't seen this concern for increasing third spacing in a sepsis patient population. So we tend to utilize propofol in, in a sepsis patient population as well. So it doesn't seem to have the same problems or we haven't at least observed that. That's good to know. What about trauma? Trauma is another area where a initial um, period of time where we're utilizing push doses of agents might be a useful option. As you, many of you can imagine, uh, these patients are at significant risk of becoming hypotensive. And so providing a medication to a patient that may cause hypotension in the setting of possible hypotension already, like trauma, is probably not a great idea. In a lot of scenarios, we tend to utilize initial doses of fentanyl and Versed, just push doses, before we have an opportunity to identify whether or not the patient does have any significant um, internal bleeding. So in those settings where we haven't gone to CT, we haven't got um, good imaging yet, we don't know if they have any uh, hemorrhage, in those situations, utilizing push doses is an option. And what about status epilepticus? Status is a, uh, has a lot of potential great options or alternatives. So um, as all of us know, we generally utilize benzodiazepines as our first-line options for trying to break these seizures. And so that's a really compelling indication for the use of Versed, not only for the induction of sedation for intubation, but also for ongoing sedation. So utilizing a benzodiazepine is excellent. However, at the same time, we certainly could utilize propofol as it also has the same type of effect. Love it. I think we're going to have to call this uh, podcast all about ketamine or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> we love ketamine, vitamin K. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to play with it. <laughs> we're such a cliche emergency physicians and pharmacists. <laughs> okay, that's it for Push Dose Pearls on RSI. Thanks, Chris, so much for your tips on all of this. 